So for our last panel of the day, um, we're going to take a little bit of a different turn. So the last panel that Ted uh, moderated talked about how about journals and um, you know journals have long served as the scientific community's uh, kind of foundation for measuring research quality and impact. Um, so it's great to hear about how they're exploring new ways to track research um, and, uh, and, and signal quality. Um, but this last panel is, is taking a different approach. So I, I think most people in this room are aware that journals aren't the only tool available for tracking research um, and for measuring research quality. Um, and kind of all the time, new opportunities are being presented by alternatives to these systems um, for improving access to knowledge and reducing gaps in knowledge creation. Um, so, for example, uh, especially in relation directly to, to journals, um, digital infrastructure is necessary to archive research data and research materials. Um, and then, you know, there are open questions around access. Um, and also how we, how we measure impact, effectiveness, and, and sustainability of these alternatives. So that's what the panel, t for this last panel of the day, we'll discuss. Um, so with us to discuss this is first Micah Altman, who's the Director of Research and Head Scientist of the MIT Libraries Program on Information Science, um, and also previously the Associate Director of the Harvard MIT Data Center. Um, Danielle Lowenberg, who's uh, three people down for me, is a Research Data Specialist and Dryad Project product manager at the California Digital Library, um, previously a publications manager at PLOS One. Um, next to her, Elizabeth Marincola, who is senior advisor to, um, for communications and advocacy of the African Academy of Sciences and also previously the, C the CEO of PLOS. Um, and then finally, Philip Cohen, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Maryland uh, and director of Social Archive, which is an open archive of the social sciences, so a preprint service. Um, so why don't I just leave it to Micah to take it away first. All right. And here it is. So in the three, four hours we have for this. Hello? That should be Beep. Buttons. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I just need to press the right one. Okay, we'll skip all of this. Uh, so there are, there, there are a whole lot of, uh, of problems that are, are being, uh, exposed, focused on, uh, they're interrelated. There are a number of um, interventions that we've seen over the last two decades from data archives to badges to executable papers to credit tra taxonomies, data citations, holdouts. Uh, I've been involved in, in a number of these. Um, and I increasingly find myself playing mix, mix and match. How do, you, how do you relate an intervention to a particular problem? Generally, there's, it's multiple, but they're going out in different ways. And one of the, you know, and one of the problems, or, or I think one of the reasons this is happening now, is because of the little digitization thing, right? So for a while, journals were, were sticky because they bundled a bunch of, of affordances in a set, in a thing that was, uh, economically difficult to disentangle. Now, search, replication, etc. It's marginally cheap, so that's that that ha that can be unbundled, and the equilibrium that was created by multiple stakeholders now can be in a whole bunch of different other places. So we need to work that out. We'll not do that in this talk, but I want to note that. Uh, different interventions that we're talking about uh, are intervening in different places. Some are about really doing science better. Um, and some interventions are about doing the dissemination part, like citations, references, et cetera. And some are, are about the life cycles of science. And if we're going to uh, maybe a, a, a way of starting to disentangle some of these and to, is to look at both what our models of inference are and what our, our models of, of documents are. Most, is there, is there a difference between, what's the difference between a, a journal that uh, is in one bound, uh, one bound volume and makes an assertion about a bunch of documents that they're in this journal and 
um, and a website and an overlay. It's, it's not the physical nature of it. It's something about the, the, the claims that are, are being made and who made them and what evidence. Um, and sometimes we, we find ourselves uh, talking about uh, differences, in, differences in approach when we're, we're actually getting a slightly different problems. Um, reproducibility versus replication, which can be, you know, which is defined nicely, but oppositely in different places. Um, and, or are, are we interested in, in, doing, uh, in doing science better? In, protect, in validating a particular, uh, a particular statement by a particular person, um, in making sure that the published literature the whole moves us more forward, faster to truth. These are different things. Uh, my uh, office of, of the vice president of research uh, and the office of research integrity at, at MIT um, was very supportive of lab notebooks. And the reason is because they want to make sure that whatever was done in the article is exactly what they said. They don't care whether it was right or reproducible or not. They just want to make sure that it was, nothing was manipulated, which is a different, uh, a different problem from wanting to make sure that things that are p-hacked are, are uh, not, you know, that we know that and can account for that in effect size. So, Here's a, uh, using, using the um, claims, evidence, and, and reproduce, and threat models may be a, a useful way to approach that. And, and looking at what stakeholders, what our theory of change is, how, how we think our intervention is going to change incentives, norms, practices in the Scala ecosystem, how that affects the key stakeholders, and how we might measure that, whether we, as, uh, so we have, I will, will end with a, a, a modest proposal about, oops. I can get it. Yeah. This? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> end with a, a modest proposal that aims, um, aims for a, a common problem that we've, we've heard across uh, some of these interventions, which is that it's hard to get reviewers. That it's some, some amount of vetting, some amount of vetting is useful. Maybe it's, it's just vetting that the uh, design was created. Maybe it's uh, vetting a data set. Maybe it's vetting some. But, but that we believe that uh, academics are willing to do peer review if it was clear that it was contributing to better scholarship. Right? And so is there, a, is there a mismatch between supply and demand? Uh, new initiatives often struggle to get people to um, participate in, in reviewing whatever the, the results of the interventions are. Um, <coughs> and can we develop a service that matches reviewers with initiatives uh, to promote better scholarship and in, in promise for more transparency about the interventions themselves? and create a, a bank of peer reviewers, thank you, um, where there's a social contract. For example, you could say, well, if you don't want to review, review for a, you're too busy now, or you don't want to review for this commercial, large commercial publisher, um, you can defer, but give a, uh, a, a open science offset. Deposit an open science offset to some some place that does not to a particular <coughs> intervention, but to some some community resource that would then be able to offer some review resources uh, to different projects on the um, with the with the promise that those interventions would give information back about what they were designed to do, what they expected, so that we have more transparency into how all of these, these interventions are working. All right. Um, Philip, do you want to go next? Sure. Happy to. Uh, you have my slides up yeah. there. Uh, I, I think I have them out here just so I can look while I'm going along. Okay, great. I only have a couple. 
Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. And I'm enjoying this um, this workshop quite a bit. Uh, I'm a sociologist, um, uh, and uh, I was interested. One of the people mentioned in passing um, that uh, I can't remember who. I'm sorry that uh, we've reached this sort of consensus that we should have open uh, data and um, uh, um, research materials in the social sciences. Um, I'm here to tell you that in sociology, we do not have a consensus like that at all. <laughs> In fact, I, I, I'm on the Publications Committee of the American Sociological Association, and I proposed that we just require that articles say whether or not materials were available, and was, was um, shot down by a large majority on that committee, because it would create some sort of um, implicit hierarchy where the people who don't do the kind of research where they can share their data would not have the badge or would look bad or would have to be, um, we're a, we're a multi-paradigmatic discipline and um, some people uh, would just always be in that sort of shunned category of not sharing. And um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and the argument that other disciplines are doing this um, doesn't really help, unfortunately. So. So we have a problem in sociology, um, uh, but sociology is also quite very, very diverse. Some people in sociology, some areas of sociology are making great progress and doing really well um, on these issues. So it's pretty interesting. Okay, so um, uh, so we created socialarchive.org, which um, social archive, which was the third um, uh, preprint server to end with XIV in its name after uh, archive and bioarchive. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. Close enough. Um, uh, I just want to say one thing about it as far as, um, uh, do I advance this myself? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, th this might or might not be helpful to the specific mission of sort of trying to work with NSF on, um, on the file drawer problem, but uh, for in our pitch to social scientists, and we, we take work from all of social sciences, also arts, humanities, law, and education, but mostly social science, um, is that, um, we have an overall credibility pro uh, project. We need we ha we we we, we want to communicate our um, our um, veracity and credibility and accountability to a lot of audiences at once. Um, like Micah said, with the with the um, dispersion of the functions of journals um, uh, to a lot of different platforms and services and communities, um, one of the things that also happens is we don't communicate to just one audience at a time. So we can't sort of have. Um, I'm doing all this work, and now I'm ready to to now offer my complete project here. Um, uh, instead, we have conferences, we have uh, we have uh, classes, we have uh, meetings of different kinds. We write in different formats, from tweets to blogs and papers and books, um, and and uh, different kinds of collaborations. And it all takes place in varying degrees in view of the public. Um, I was uh, amused by the um, the comment. Um, earlier, um, and I don't remember anybody's name, I'm sorry, the, the guy who was right there in the middle, the, uh, uh, the uh, economics journal editor, um, that papers in economics are out there for years before they're finally published. Well, that's really not what publishing is. If they're out there for years, they're published, <laughs> right? Um, before a journal decides to put their brand on them um, is, is, is how I would describe that difference. Um, but, um, but Okay, so we have this general problem, this general mission of speaking to a lot of audiences at once. So one of the things we have to communicate is our, um, is our accountability. And even to people who are not gonna use our code um, um, or, or understand our data and so on, we have to communicate this, um, that we are accountable. So that's part of what um, we try to convince people of to use something like Social Archive. Um, I, I call it pentagulation when I'm giving this. This is a separate talk I could happy to give about how individual researchers um, use the different parts of their different parts of communication to reach different audiences. Sorry, I'm looking at my slide, it's great. Oh, there it is. Um, uh, so you have, you do your peer reviewed work, um, uh, you share your research and materials, you write in more popular formats like on your website or your blog and your social media, you communicate with different audiences all as part of one sort of, one research process, including the media. Um, and um, the open scholarship part of that, um, which includes your, your failed projects, your uh, null results, um, sort of your lab notebook, whatever, obviously you don't reveal everything to everybody all the time, but your general package of communication about your work um, uh, is all part of this general, this, this larger project, that's what I'm trying to say. So uh, very briefly, um, uh, and, and this would be appropriate for, now I'm getting slightly back on, back on topic for today's workshop about um, 
uh, about the file drawer problem. One of the things we want to do is increase the uh, value and reduce the um, uh, investment needed to um, share things like null findings, um, work that's not important enough to be in a journal, work that doesn't go in the, in the, um, uh, the big if true category, if you will, but is, um, uh, um, but is nonetheless valuable and part of your overall work. Just to show you, this is just one file on Social Archive, and just to show you what sort of what we're trying to produce with a with a short investment of time on the part of the researcher. So you upload your paper, in this case the paper by me, called The Coming Divorce Decline. Um, uh, you, the first red box there shows um, it, it, there's the submitted date and the last edited date and then uh, a link to the supplemental materials. That's where I put the data and code. So I do that at the time that I upload the paper. The data and code is there and sort of forever linked off this page. Um, uh, going to the far uh, your far right, um, we give the paper a uh, DOI at that time, at the time that it's accepted to the service. Um, that DOI will always link back now to this page. Um, so uh, uh, when you, as you work on the paper, revise the paper, et cetera, um, you, uh, you've shared it, it and you, the link brings people back to this page. Okay, this is not, um, most of you probably know about this. Um, uh, the, on that side, you see the version history. So as the paper evolves, um, I upload new versions of the paper, and um, the newest one is always the one that's on top when somebody comes to this page, but the version history is preserved with the dates of each each one so that as I changed it, in this case, the, the project went on long enough that a new year of data came out, my prediction came true, um, that divorce rate would decline again, it did, so I updated the paper right away. Um, and so now the, you, the, that's like between version three and version four that happened. Um, uh, then eventually I published it, in this case I published it in an open access journal called Socius, um, so I was able to share the journal PDF here as the final version, um, that's, now the, that's now the top version that people see, and that's when um, I also added the um, journal DOI onto this page. So now something like Google Scholar or somebody like that um, can combine the citations to these, um, to these works into one, uh, uh, into one citation count, or people who come to this page because they got a link to the preprint can now go to that journal page if they want to sort of look at the official version. Um, uh, 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 like that. You can see the other metadata there, the tags and disciplines that I apply. Um, we've, uh, we've added a few little um, uh, services on top of this. Um, uh, Samin mentioned the plaudit, uh, the plaudits, that plaudit handshake, uh, clapping hand button is new. Um, if you have an ORCID, um, you can plot it. Um, you can plot it anything with the DOI now. Um, but uh, but it's but you'll see that icon on the Source Archive pages and all the papers. When you click on that button, you have a, you have a choice. You can you can say it's robust, it's clear, it's exciting. If you choose any of those three things, you have plotted in the paper. It goes on your ORCID. Uh, your plotted um, page, but it also will will be visible to people who come to this page in the future. They can click on that and see the people who've plotted it, um, who've, who've endorsed this paper. Um, it's not too hard also for those of you who are technically, a little bit technically inclined, I also, that you also get an RS, you can generate an RSS feed for your plotted, so if you want to follow the papers that I plotted, you can follow, I created a Twitter account, so it's PNC plotted, and you can see all the, the papers that I like as I go around my business. If I click plotted on something, it generates a tweet. It doesn't have that many followers yet, but it could. Okay, and then um, we also have the hypothesis, um, the last thing on there, uh, there, um, the hypothesis annotation tool. So um, that is, uh, a, that's a tool for adding uh, annotations to the, to the papers. Um, you can do those in closed groups, or you can do them publicly. So you can do, you can do various, kinds of various kinds of assessment reviewing. Um, responding and so on to the papers. So the idea is um, at whatever stage you're ready to share this paper, and there are a lot of other things that provide these same services, I just am promoting ours. Um, at whatever stage you're prepared to share that unit of research, we want to make it as easy as possible to get the things that you want, which is permanence, discoverability, um, accountability in that it's time stamped, um, and, uh, and uh, always linked to this page. It's moderated, it's not peer reviewed, but we moderate to just make sure it is a paper, basically. Um, uh, and uh, and it's, uh, it's versioned. So uh, in, in just a couple of minutes, you get all of that and you can put your null results or your, uh, um, uh, or your boring papers or anything like that up here. Um, and uh, that's what we're trying to do, thanks. Awesome, thank you. I think we'll have Daniela go next. I'll get this slide up.
Cool. So I'm not going to use slides. This is just a background image of a book I'm going to talk about. But my name is Daniela. I work in open data infrastructure and open data advocacy. I'm the product manager for Dryad. Um, but I also implemented the open data policy across the PLOS journals. So I'm carrying some background about actually how we're getting data to be published. But today I want to talk about if we're unlocking the file drawer, how are we actually incentivizing researchers to publish their data? And you can quote me, and everyone hates me for it, I will say there is no credit for data right now, and we do not have an incentive system for research data to be published. And so um, I want to go through some of the principles. We just released this book. It's free as an ebook at opendatametrics.org. Uh, we published it last week. And this is a book that was funded by the Sloan Foundation, uh, written by members of a team I'm on called Make Data Count, which is a Sloan-funded grant to develop the infrastructure for data-level metrics. Um, and I kind of want to go through what it is that we believe we can take to actually get to a point of having data metrics, which will eventually get us to a point of having credit for data. Um, but that's just not something we have right now. And so it's kind of based around these five steps that we think we can all take. And step one is that the community needs to value data. And we would say that that's already happened. We are talking about research data. Funders are playing a role in this. Publishers have policies. Repositories are getting massive amounts of data. That's already happening. So we've actually done a good job in the last 10 years getting data to be a thing. And actually, if we look way before that even, researchers have always cared about data. It's, why they're, it's what they're using for their research. It's just a matter of calling out why it needs to be shared. So OK, step one, great. We're doing great work on that. Everyone in this room probably cares about data in some form. But step two is having transparent infrastructure. So when we look at a data repository or wherever data is being held, supplemental file, wherever, you're going to see views and downloads and other quote unquote metrics there, but none of them are comparable. Right? So we're looking at views and downloads in one repository and another. In journal articles, there is a standard for that. And so you actually can compare those. And so we wrote a counter code of practice for research data that's been implemented by six major repositories now. But what that is to say is actually, how can we standardize the views and downloads that are coming in? And a great example of why that needs to happen, we went and saw one of the data sets in Dryad that had the highest usage. A researcher at Harvard wrote to us, said that they were going to get an R01 grant. They needed to put, they wanted their newest numbers. They were so excited because they had hundreds of thousand downloads. And we found that when we standardized it, there was actually only 2,000 downloads. And that's because it was a bot from a Chinese address that was just scanning the page. So we actually have to be thinking about these things for data and not just put out these numbers and say they're trustworthy. So um, if for those who are interested in infrastructure, we have actually leveraged community initiatives with Crossref and Datasite and others. We have a framework for open data uh, standardized usage and actually a place where it can be submitted. So if anyone is a repository and wants to talk about it at a coffee break, we can talk about that. But the other side of that is data citation for this infrastructure, right? So if there's publishers in the room, if you are submitting data citations, thank you. Most of the world's publishers are not submitting data citations to Crossref. So if we look at how many times a researcher has actually said that um, they're referencing a data set in a publication, we usually can't actually find that in an open way um, because it's just not being indexed. And so the biggest takeaway there is we need publishers to be submitting data citations to open infrastructure being Crossref. And it's essential all of this is open because we need to be able to know that these numbers are trustworthy. So if we look at what happened in the article world, we all depended on infrastructure for metrics, but it went to commercial entities and we actually don't know how things are calculated or where those numbers came from. So step three is now we've, we have all this data coming in. We have usage and citations coming in, altmetrics, Twitter, um, all feeding into this open framework. We actually need bibliometricians to start doing studies to understand what data usage means. Why do researchers download data but don't cite data? Why do researchers in sociology download it this way but researchers in ecology download it this way? All of these different facets need to be looked at. 
Um, and we don't believe that the infrastructure builders are the people that can assign meaning to that. And especially without having that comparable stuff right now, so we can see that data sets are indexed everywhere and then the views and downloads aren't aggregated and then we're telling researchers that they have two downloads but they actually have 20,000. And so we need, res we need this research, qualitative and quantitative, to understand researcher behavior, to actually understand data sharing more generally. And then step five, the final step, is that we need community agreement on this. So even if we're not all going to be building or contributing or say you're a researcher, not an infrastructure person, we need the entire community to buy in to these open data metrics if we're going to have this. We can't then have, we want commercial entities to be involved in this, sure, the door is open, everyone should get involved, but if we put this out there and then we have other entities try and go build other things, we're never going to have credit for data. We have to have the community actually weigh in and agree on what the right thing is. Um, and we do know that there are plenty of initiatives out there right now building a data impact factor. Um, which would be really awesome to read the book on why we think that's not something somewhere we should go. We shouldn't just be replicating what happened in articles for data. Data are very different. So, um, yeah, the, the big takeaway is that if we want to keep increasing the amount of data that's being published, unlock the file drawer, comply with NSF policies around data, we have to come to some sort of an agreement about building metrics, and we're not there yet, but we have some ideas. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, and our last last panelist, Elizabeth Marincola. I'll get your slide up. Oh, thank Oops. you. Uh, I am not going to give a talk for the following reasons. One is I'm talking tomorrow. I don't want to be redundant. Another is that I've actually been very inspired by many of the things I've heard here, so I'd rather be extemporaneous and use my time to respond to many of them. Uh, and thirdly is I took seriously the five minutes, one slide thing. Uh, so I will try to be brief and fast uh, and tell you a small part of my story, which is the following. I left uh, PLOS, where I was a colleague of Daniela, uh, and uh, to go to the African Academy of Sciences in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, to, among other things, uh, um, take control of their publishing operations, which did not exist. Uh, when I got there, there was literally a, a paper contract on my desk to review from Elsevier proposing uh, Scientific African and wanting uh, the uh, African Academy of Sciences to partner with them to uh, launch this journal because they recognized that there wasn't an Africa-wide um, uh, uh, journal uh, for publishing across the sciences. Uh, and I said, no. We're not going to partner with Elsevier. In fact, given that there's essentially nothing here, now there are many specialty journals in Africa. I don't mean to say there aren't journals in Africa, but there was no Africa-wide pan-African journal for publication. Um, I said, no, since we're starting from nothing in terms of communications here, we are going to address all these issues that have been discussed since 8.30 this morning, they've been identified. We know what they are. Now we can create a, not journal, but platform uh, for some of the reasons that have been touched on uh, that will leapfrog ahead of the rest of the world because it will be designed to address the problems that have unfolded slowly over centuries in the, journal, in the paper journal publishing world. So we launched uh, AS Open Research uh, in partnership with F1000 on the model of, uh, of uh, Welcome Open Research and Gates Open Research. And what this is is an entirely open publishing platform that's peer reviewed, addressing, as I say, many, many of the problems that, that's been discussed today. We've discussed null results. We've, we publish not only null results, we, uh, we publish any research outputs that can be subject to peer review. So data sets, code, uh, observational studies, uh, protocols, reviews, case studies, replication studies that have al also been discussed today. So we consider any valid output that can be peer reviewed to be publishable information and we accept all of it and encourage all of it on AS Open uh, Research. One thing that hasn't been talked about much today 
is, um, although it was touched on, is how slow publishing is for multiple reasons. One is people are working down the impact factor pecking order. They go for the highest impact factor journal they think they might be considered at when, you know, that'll take months, then they get rejected, and then they go to another one, and on, on, on. Uh, the tyranny of the impact factor, that's a big uh, problem that we're trying to break down with alt metrics and other solutions. Um, so uh, the premise of AS Open Research that I'll talk about more tomorrow is you're published uh, first and then you're peer reviewed. And this has a number, of, uh, a number of advantages. One is it's immediate. It's reviewed only to make sure it's science and not nonsense. Uh, then and that the data is there and complete. Once it's past that rather basic threshold, it's published and then it's peer reviewed. The peer review is transparent. Uh, the peer reviewers are, are identified and any reader can interact with the peer reviewer and the author so that there can be a discussion around the peer review. When it meets a certain threshold of approval that again I'll talk about tomorrow, it is then indexed. So we make a distinction, uh, not only between uh, evaluation and publication, but between publication and indexing. And that way you don't have unnecessary delays and everything is done out in the open. Um, uh, we also demand that our uh, data is uh, formatted so it's findable, mineable, completely accessible, and uh, usable by anybody who has uh, internet access. Um, so uh, we, uh, by doing this, we uh, solved a lot of problems at once. One is to provide a pan-African, pan-scientific, reputable, peer-reviewed uh, journal in which Africans can uh, publish. Anybody that's associated even indirectly with uh, an African grant can publish in, uh, in, uh, on, uh, but also it gives a very viable, uh, valuable uh, alternative to scientists in Africa who tend to disproportionately fall uh, victim to predatory publishers that tend to target them and uh, convince them that their uh, platforms are uh, reputable and it can not only be not helpful to careers, it can be damaging to careers, uh, many, many of which otherwise have much to offer. Uh, one thing we have not tackled, and nobody has tackled successfully, but I applaud, I think it was Micah who was talking about uh, the problems of peer review, is how to unclog the, the clog in the peer review system. It, it, it's what holds everything up. I know from having run PLOS that when you get an irate email from an author saying, you've had my paper for a year, what's happening? The answer is always, we've asked 37 people to peer review it and you know nobody will. And then you're moving farther and farther away from the expertise required for the paper and therefore even when you get that 38th person to do the peer review, they're probably marginally qualified to do the peer review and therefore it's not a good peer review. So all of this is, in my opinion, uh, the, the next big frontier to tackle in, uh, in scientific publishing. And I think we've, I love the idea of um, carbon offsets. <laughs> Was it you said that? Oh, it was yeah, Micah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love the idea of carbon offsets for peer review. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I had never heard that before. Uh, another much more crude uh, and unimaginative solution is pay peer reviewers. They're mostly postdocs anyway who aren't making any money and who can hardly afford to spend their precious time uh, as a 42-year-old postdoc with two children living in a garage. Uh, uh, to be contributing to the uh, scientific journal uh, uh, community. Um, so, you know, paying peer reviewers is not an original idea, it's not a creative idea, but it's also not gotten any tra uh, traction. So, uh, and I don't think that either of these solutions are necessarily uh, the solution, it's probably gonna be a combination of solutions, but we've got to do something to tackle in a systematic way uh, the peer review problem. Uh, anyway, 
Uh, I, that's a thumbnail of AS Open Research. It's been extremely well received. Uh, authors uh, can't believe the speed with which their work gets out there. Uh, it's extremely important, especially uh, in places uh, like where I work, that uh, communication is sometimes not as expedient. I was talking with my table mates this morning about the problems of getting, uh, g physically getting to other countries, all the visa problems and everything. That's a big issue within Africa and for Africans traveling uh, out to other countries outside of Africa. And that limits their exposure. It limits their ability to interact with colleagues. At least they shouldn't be disadvantaged in terms of uh, their ability to publish and the ability of people to find uh, and mine what they've published. Okay, thank you. I think before I open up to the audience, I wanted to ask a, a quick question to maybe to everyone. Um, so a lot of these ideas are, are relatively new and I'm, I'm thinking a lot about sustainability and wondering if um, you can talk about how uh, for each of these uh, you know, kinds of infrastructure or platforms, how you're thinking about sustainability. Anyone can take that. Uh, I'll just say that uh, there are APCs associated with uh, AS Open Research as there uh, are with PLOS, uh, but it's also the case that uh, these are routinely covered by grants. Uh, and so the system is somewhat self-sustaining, as Daniela mentioned. Uh, funders have to be on board. They have to be um, uh, rebalancing their budget budgets towards APCs away from subscription fees. Uh, the total amount of money they spend doesn't necessarily have to differ. It's how they spend it for publication. So I think it's critical, um, for example, Research for Life that had this well-intentioned idea to have uh, pulled together uh, commercial publishers and get them to waive subscription fees uh, for uh, people in underdeveloped countries just seemed to me an ass backwards idea. I mean, it's just validating subscription magazines. What you should be doing is more aggressively enabling, although it may have been important and valid and necessary when it first got off the ground. I don't mean to say it was a bad idea originally, but now I think it's anachronistic. What we really need to do is redirect that money towards enabling people to publish open access. Um, I, I, um, I quite relate my view as close to that, I think. Um, we have to get away from the um, reader pays to the communication as part of the research expense. So whoever is paying for the research should be paying for communicating the research. Um, uh, uh, Social Archive is free to use. Um, we're on the, open, uh, the Center for Open Science um, preprints platform. Um, so we're running on what's left of their big grants, um, uh, uh, which hopefully they'll have more of. Um, but they have, as of next year, COS is going to start charging the preprint services on their platform. Um, so uh, the details are not exactly worked out yet, but we're in a position where we're going to have to raise something like $10,000 a year to keep Social Archive running. Um, uh, and uh, that's really not too bad. We take in about, um, um, you know, s s this year, like a, maybe a, a little over 1,000 papers. So it's less than $10 a paper. It's a lot. It should cost a lot less as it grows. I assume it will cost a lot less. Um, but uh, yes, we have to have sustainability. We want it to be academy-owned. Um, so we are looking for a home inside an academic library um, and uh, will be owned by a university somewhere soon. Hopefully, stay tuned. I can add that for something like data metrics, we can continue to be sustainable if we all continue to support the essential infrastructure providers like Crossref and Datasite and don't just get put into marketing from people that are saying they have metrics right now. So there are a lot of commercial entities that say we have package bundles and you know all these things of uh, metrics and things that are there but they're all relying on those central infrastructure people too so it's important that for the sustainability it's sustainable right now so long as we continue on our way and don't try and pay for the add-ons instead of just supporting the essential people in the process okay. Do you want to add anything? Well, I, part of my research is in digital preservation, so sustainability is a topic that we think about a lot. Um, I, 
I, I have my uh, concerns about APCs and shifting the, um, and, and modeling things around purely uh, economic transactional bases. Um, I, think, uh, I think that that knowledge wants somebody else to pay for it. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not a public good and it's not, uh, it's not a private good, but uh, what, we, what we need is a uh, mechanism, me more mechanisms for um, getting the value of, of uh, the research process uh, back into community organizations and into some, um, some commons rather than having uh, a lot of it siphoned off through network economies of scale and on commercial, commercial publications. Uh, so rather than, than the, I, I would like not to pay people for, for um, peer review, for example, not to go to that directly, but to, to be able to expose that as something that we, we value and give and give credit for it and, um, and can coordinate on effectively so that we're, we're making our contributions in, in the areas and with the effects that we, we value. Um, I think moving it, moving things into sustainability through pure market solutions um, is not our, uh, is generally not our strength. All right, I'll open this up to the audience if, if anyone has any questions or comments or discussion topics. Thanks. Uh, my name is Sam Toplitsky. I'm the Open Science Librarian here at Berkeley. Uh, my question is about how do you shift the culture and encourage researchers to cite from diverse sources like the places you represent um, most researchers um, cite from a very small slice of the literature and aren't um, really probing deeply. I mean, obviously it depends um, discipline by discipline, but they, they really aren't consulting the vast resources that are out there, either data or um, citing directly from preprints or a resource like you represent. Mm -hmm. And one of the, your sibling archive groups does a lot of work around social media and promoting each each and every preprint that comes out, which is a huge amount of work. So I don't know if that's what has to happen to encourage the work to get out, but if you have any thoughts on, on that, I'd, I'd be interested to uh, Just quickly, because you mentioned the preprints. Um, of getting a, Putting a paper on Search Archive is not an indicator of its quality or citability. Um, it could be total crap. Um, so I would not, um, I, uh, so that, and that's a really tricky thing. Um, it could be great, it could be a preprint of an already published paper, it could be, um, um, so I don't have a, I don't have a solution for that except um, um, uh, yeah, I don't have a solution for that. I had I had an, I, something to say but I forgot. Except that it's all a cycle. Of course, you know the more uh, something is accessible, uh, the more likely it is to be cited because the more likely it is that the person will have run across it, and that comes down to to uh, searchability and mineability and so forth. So you have to recognize the play. I mean, obviously you do, but. Uh, you have to recognize its place in a cycle. In terms of, and I, I also agree that with somebody who said that you know journals are sort of dying out, and now we're going to these different solutions that can be tailored in the way we want. And I think as we do that, people will read less and less by a journal title. You know, gone are the days that oh my issue of science came in the mail and I'm gonna browse the TSC. We just don't wanna replace that with another proxy. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. As, as in using journal titles right. as proxies. It does depend, I remember what I was gonna say now, it does depend on, the, on what, what you're using it for, who the reader is and what they want. In my area, I'm happy to read preprints of unpublished, unpeer-reviewed work in, work in the area that I know really well because I can tell if it's good or not. If it's, wow, oh my gosh, look, new, exciting new paper. Um, I don't care that's not peer reviewed. I can review it myself and in an hour from now I can decide. Um, but on the other hand, I also write like an undergraduate textbook. Um, uh, it has 13 chapters of stuff I'm not expert in at all. I have to cite hundreds of things. Um, I tend to go by where is this published and has it been cited a lot 
And if it is, okay, I'm going to rely on that and stick that citation in my paragraph because I'm writing an undergraduate textbook here. I need some authority. I need someone to tell me that this is a legit thing in an area I don't really understand. So the, there's no shortcut to that, but it's but but to um, to read and understand. So I, I'm glad that the point about developing researchers uh, come up because I think it's very something that you know I've had to think about a lot, and I, I think I'm blessed to be part of a sort of the development economics community where most of the young scholars really care about the development of their colleagues in the, in the world, and that sort of that community is much more important than any financial reward would be in terms of the review process. But there's another wrinkle that I wanted to raise, and I'm wondering why Elizabeth doesn't come up in, in your situation, is that. So many of the, of the authors in developing countries are in universities where deans have journalists, and those are incredibly conservative. That is, they don't change at all. I mean, even like the AJ journals, which we all think are better than the, than the field journals, are not listed because they haven't been around long enough and because things don't change very quickly. So, so for better or worse, uh, and I guess in better for my case, you know, publishing in my journal really, really matters for these scholars because they're on the list that are required for, pub for a promotion, and then they're not going to change quickly. So I'm wondering, is that not a problem for your, uh, your population? And it's part of the ecosystem that we need to think about. Um, to some extent, it feels like we're having a first world conversation, but, but how do we think about that particular problem where we really can't change the way the deans think? It's not a problem for my platform because that's, uh, th that is recognized by universities throughout um, uh, Africa, but it is a problem in general in that, as you say, it's a restricted list. Sometimes it can be a little random. It's not based on anything um, uh, objective. Um, and I wouldn't want it to be because the only thing I can think of that they would base it on is an impact factor, and I'm not in favor of, of reinforcing the impact factor. Um, <clears throat> So it can be uh, restrictive, and so I think that's really a matter of uh, education. I know I've engaged a lot of universities around Africa to talk about um, uh, either doing away altogether with the lists or uh, having a broader view of what a legitimate place to publish is. The lists were inspired by the prolifer proliferation of predatory journals, so it was meant to protect scholars in Africa from falling prey to predatory journals. The intentions were good, but it, it, it is l much less than optimally executed. I agree with you. I, I, I think my comment goes along similar lines as Andy has, and, and it ties back into something um, that was said earlier. The lists are essentially, how are we trying to assess the quality of a particular researcher, because that's who we are evaluating, and the shortcuts we take are essentially due to lack of data, is one way to put it, right? So I'm very intrigued by the idea of article-specific, which ultimately can be aggregated to author-specific uh, factors of some sort of success. And that relates back to the comments I've gotten back a lot of times about um, data citations. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, community values data Actually not, because I've had authors actually tell me, no, 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 I don't want a data citation. I want them to cite my article. I said, you've put so much work into your data. No, the article counts. The article counts because the department chairs don't care about data citations. They care about article counts, because the article counts are in a journal that's on the list or something like that or something that they know. They don't care about open ICPSR or Dataverse or whatever. They don't care if that has 200 downloads and the article has two citations. That doesn't matter. So. That's not a, 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 that's not a cause that's already won. So while people value data, they don't value the job or the place where data is or the metrics that are associated with it, et cetera, that hasn't yet permeated um, the actual publishing world. How to get there is a challenge that relies in part on metrics like data citations, ability to measure these kinds of impacts that go across that particular panel that you're sitting on. Um, that that are, are similar in one sense of, of, of getting that out there. So, but I, I, I do want to point out, I get that way too often for me to uh, support the statement that the community as such values data. 
Yeah, when I say the community values data, I mean the fact that we're even talking about it right now means it's something that we care about, and researchers are using it to write their articles. So inherently, um, data Those is are not the same thing. We're very selective here. We showed up because we care about data, and all those that didn't show up, that's a different story. Yeah, I just, I'm saying yeah. the scholarly communications world, data is valued within Scalcroms, those who show up to the meetings that want to talk about it in our building, mm -hmm. but we disagree on this. So I would say that when the other points you brought up is what we wrote in the book. I mean, that's what we're saying. I mean, it's a chicken and egg, but we don't have metrics for data, so how are we gonna tell a researcher to do data citation over the article citation? Because we don't know what it means and most of those citations are getting lost in publishers anyways. So mm -hmm. we don't have a good system right now, it sucks. That's, the, that's what we're saying. We don't have that, and so how can we go back and tell a researcher, yeah, no, you have to do it this way because we don't, we don't know what it means and we don't actually have something to show them. Hi, Sean Grant, uh, Indian University. I think um, there's a theme that is pretty common in this space, or at least increasingly common in this space, that I feel like has come up a bit in this panel, so I'd be keen to get your thoughts, and this is pace, and just how many papers there are, and how much data there is. The needing 37 peer reviewers, in another journal where it's probably about 15 to 20 every time I'm looking for reviewers. So proposals to basically try and slow this whole thing down. Right, anything's to do rate limiters, and there have been a lot of provocative proposals about cap, caps on papers per year or things of that nature that I think are quite controversial. I think I'd just be keen to get folks' take on this panel about do we need to slow down how much output researchers are producing, or is that not the problem and it's something else we need to focus on? Well, this is the first time I've heard the concept of slowing down the flow, but I would just I would submit, and I acknowledge it's a fire hose of information, but I, I guess my first reaction is uh, that probably slowing things down may not be the solution. It's a pyramid, a lot of stuff falls to the bottom and gets very little visibility, um, and that may uh, fall under its own weight because there's not enough incentive for people to go to the trouble of writing things up like people were saying about null findings. but. Uh, I guess I'm struggling to imagine why a uh, systematic effort to slow down the slow of publication is going to be productive. I think I would rather remove the uh, barriers that exist, such as in peer review, uh, and kind of let a market force take hold in that uh, the stuff that's not worth publishing and there's no reward for publishing will kind of naturally disappear just because it, 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 there's not enough cost benefit to it. Well, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a historian, but um, this, uh, this sort of interjection um, has happened before. I mean, there were, there, around the time of the, the Gutenberg press, there were people complaining about the production of, of Britain. Too, too much was going to be written too carefully and, and not having to you know, write it down meant that you really didn't think about it, et cetera. Uh, having, having been in the library world by proxy for a while, uh, 25 years ago, the only way to to find, or approximately 30, the way to find something was to catalog it, and and there were too many, there are too many things coming out to catalog, and, and too many web pages coming out to catalog. It turns out that Google does a, it, it's not as good as a professional cataloger at $75 an hour, but at, <laughs> at seven, oh, you know, uh, oh, which, and, 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 Usually a book takes a, about two hours to do original cataloging, so the rate is 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 it's not as good as professionally cataloging, but it's a lot cheaper, <laughs> and and we can we can catalog a lot of web pages at scale. Um, we do have to accept some some cross some quality trade offs, and that creates needs for other mechanisms, and I think that's what we're. We're pointing at. I don't. I don't think the answer is to. Sometimes the answer is to shift the costs to people. I don't think the answer is to to slow the tap. Mm 
But I do think in the case of journals and the journal system, we do have the problem of, of producing vast amounts of redundant information because our productivity is measured in number of journal articles. If we could get, if we could not do that anymore, you could think, you could imagine, for example, one researcher working on a project over 10 years, instead of producing 50 articles, um, could produce um, one or two um, streams of results and interpretations, which instead of having chunks bid out, which were determined to be final and approved and done and versions of record and published and produced and sold in that unit, um, in, if, if instead we were, we were producing results and interpretation on a more ongoing basis, um, you could have, um, the, the, the person encountering that literature could have less different things to look at to try to catch up. So like, oh, if I really want to go deep into this literature, sure, I want to read the thousand pages that this person wrote. But if I'm just kind of interested in this and I go to Google Scholar and I find that the person has written 50 articles, which one do I read first, right? Um, so, um, so, so um, and that's just, the article, that's just the business model of the journal that's just, that we're all being crushed by. I think we have time for one more before we take a break. Um, thanks, thanks for this discussion. The, the one thing that crosses my mind, I, I wouldn't think slowing down in, in terms of affecting the intention of affecting the rate of, of results coming out would be a good idea. But it does seem to me that if, if the, the rate at which they're being produced affects the quality of the results, that it is time to slow down to finish a project, or to, to truly finish a project before one is actually on to the next and ignoring kind of, you know, backwards. Which is something I actually see quite a bit. I see that people are like interested in their next thing. And this other thing is just, hey, well, let's get this thing done. And it's, it's not taking the same kind of attention. Yeah. 